thank you all for coming out to a, another rebuild honestly um this is our uh, monthly talk that we do for black excellence kc uh to really just get the community engaged with um just conversations that we feel like need to be had um with our community and i think it's 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 a uh, it's good to have it in a public setting too so that everybody can see the perspectives that we come from uh tonight is real special um only because it's going to be really um educational for me right and i'm gonna be just transparent honest i've always been that kind of guy uh you know as we were going through our strategic plan uh with black excellence uh one of our facilitators asked us um what is the community that you're supposed to be reaching but you're not reaching and I had to have uh, just that mirror in my face of understanding that I have not intentionally uh, served uh, all communities within the black community. And so um, I want to be more intentional about that. Um, I didn't want to be cliche and uh, have my panel talk during Pride Month. Uh, but I just learned I just learned that Black Pride Month is in August. So maybe I'll be better at that. Um, but, um, you know, I just want to be more intentional about it because as a black community, we need each other. Uh, in all of the trials and tribulations that we go through, uh, working through the system that's really not built for us. Um, and so we need all of us uh, to be able to be successful and get the sustainability and the growth as a community together. So um, this is an opportunity again, going through the, trying to figure it out. That's why I only came out a week ago because we had to figure out how the hell we was gonna talk about stuff. Me being a person that don't know what to talk about, um, but also just, again, I had to have that self-reflection and understand that this is an opportunity for me to step back and uh, bring some people to the stage that are doing the work, uh, that have been doing the work, um, and that way I can learn with everybody else. So I'm sorry for taking up all your time, um, but I just want to get that out there because I feel like it's important to be transparent as an organization. Um, you know what I mean? But yeah, appreciate y'all. Uh, I'm going to let y'all introduce yourselves and thank everybody for coming out. That was so good, great. <laughs> Can we do one more applause, please? Thank y'all. So before we get started, I just wanna extend some gratitude and say thank you for Craig, the team behind Black Excellence KC for creating this space and opportunity for, have a, for us to have this conversation. And also a special thanks to the Keystone people for always making sure that there is space for us and consistently putting creatives on panels and letting us say whatever we got to say and be us unapologetically. So thank you all for this incredible opportunity. And last, thank y'all for being here. I feel like we've been in a, a chaotic week. So thank y'all for making space to be here. This is an important conversation. I was so excited to be asked to moderate. I love these three people. I've met them in different spaces, doing different things, and I'm just honored to be able to share some stage with y'all. So thanks also to our panelists. So now that we got the housekeeping out of the way, I just wanna, set, I wanna start with setting some intention. So this conversation is supposed to center a lot of different intersectionalities here that happen in Kansas City. Black queerness, of course, if you didn't know, now you know. Um, that is going to be a lot of the foundation for the conversation here tonight. And so I hope that you understand that this is an opportunity, even if you do not identify as someone that is a part of this community, that you are here to listen and to learn, okay? And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself and then I'll have you guys introduce yourselves. I'm someone who is notorious for like loaded questions. So when you all go, if you could just give us your names, your pronouns, tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about what you do. And then also the bonus question, when you heard you were gonna be on a black queer panel, the immediate, ugh, moment you had, okay? What's the ick? So I'm Corey, I have a bookstore, real cute, it's in Midtown. If you haven't been, it's black and brown. Thanks guys. And I'm just here to share space. And so 
I'll let y'all start. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Hey everyone, I'm Nasir Anthony Montalvo. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I'm the founder and curator of a project called Black Queer Kansas City. It's a project with the Kansas City Defender, a black digital news organization. BQKC is an investigative project sharing the history of black queer Kansas Cityans from the 1900s to present day. Um, there have been three articles so far. Um, the first one was on the first documented black drag queens of Kansas City. The second one was on an organization of people fighting racism amidst the gay community. And the last piece that I've written was on um, this TV show that used to air here um, that was called Out There. It was a gay and lesbian variety show in the 90s. Um, the project has since um, taken uh, different formats. It's a digital archive. It's also a moving exhibition. There's an exhibit open right now at PH Coffee. The exhibits have also featured at Black and Brown Bookstore, um, Cafe Corazon, and um, Blackout. And the project is also sponsored by a host of organizations, including more recently the University of Kansas, so period. Um, the ugh, moment for me, that's a good question. Um, I guess the ick moment for me is that sometimes like having to put like queerness on display and talking to people. Um, I just think about, I'm a, I can be a very like pessimistic person. And so I just think about like, oh, who's gonna show up and like cause problems or be like, why y'all like this? Why y'all like that? Like, I ain't trying to hear all that. <laughs> so that was an ick moment for me, but I'm excited to be here. And um, thank you, Craig. So period. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I know I speak softly sometimes. So my name is Aisha Brown. I am a registered nurse um, and the founder of Queer Black KC, which is a new organization um, that creates spaces for the black LGBT community here. Um, we have been hosting events for a few months now, brand new. Um, we have an event this weekend. It is a day party. Um, we have a nature series. So like we're doing yoga, the yoga instructors here in the front, Miss Queen Wilkes. Um, and we are going kayaking next month. Um, and hopefully we're planning a, a camping trip maybe. I don't know. But yeah, we have like a whole array of things to do. But the goal is to create those safe spaces to uh, bring people together because the idea is if you are constantly in contact with somebody you know what's going on with them you you know if they need you you're already there if you're already around somebody you can support them when they need you so um and then my ick moment, my initial reaction to this was like who all gonna be there like <laughs> and i actually asked craig i was like so <laughs> who's on the panel <laughs> who's the audience so that was uh, my initial reaction to it All right, check, check. Cool. Hey, everybody. I am uh, State Rep, uh, State Representative Ashley Bland Manlove. Um, I'm born and raised here in Kansas City. Uh, represent uh, the south side of Kansas City, uh, 75th to 99th homes to Cerner. I represent you in Jefferson City. Um, what was the other question? What's your ick? Right. Um, <clears throat> my ick moment was man, I, I don't think nobody going to show. And right now, um, a lot of people are very upset about a lot of different things, including a lot of things that we're going to talk about on this stage tonight. Um, but they don't really seem to be engaging past Twitter. Um, and, you know, you don't really accomplish anything online except for probably making somebody mad. But that's not how laws are changed and that's not how we get fixed. So it's it's part of my goal. I just get on tangents about us not voting and 12 percent turnouts and then fussing about the system doesn't work anyway. So um, I was I was I was a uh, concern that when nobody show up, but it's, it's a nice little it's a nice little crowd. I've been to a couple Casual. of these. It's a nice little crowd. So I'm happy about it. Good to see y'all. Thank y'all for sharing that. OK, before we get into it, because I feel like we got to just start basis. Right. This is a conversation for learning spaces. So. 
I can imagine how many people have probably, you've probably introduced yourself and been like, I'm a state rep. And people have like been like, yeah, that's great. And have no idea what that is. Can you tell us what does the state rep do? And I got to backtrack. I didn't use my pronouns because I'm, I'm an elder millennial, so I'm not used to this pronoun stuff yet. Um, so it's she, her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what does a state rep do? Um, it is the job of a state representative to make, create, and change laws at the state level that affect you. Um, so I work with the governor and the Senate. So it's the same as the feds. It's a bicameral, it's two pieces, uh, a Senate and a House. Um, and I'm in the, 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 lower, the lower house, even though we're supposed to be equal, but it's the lower house, um, which is the representative. So it's uh, 160 some of us. Um, it's 120, to the, 120 of them, 40 of us, uh, must have been Democrats. Um, you know, and we're the ones saying no human is illegal. No, you know, women have the right to you know, autonomy for their own body. Um, voting shouldn't be difficult. Um, fund our schools and our roads. I think that's the basis of what um, government is supposed to do. So if you have heard of um, your SNAP benefits, so your Medicaid, um, um, DESE, all of those, um, Department of Labor, the people who do your unemployment, all of that is at the state, not the city council, the state. So that's what I try to do. Um, I've also been chair of the Black Caucus um, which is all of the black legislators. Um, we got up to like 25 of us now between the House and the Senate, um, and we all come together. And so I was the leader of all of them for a little while as well. So I'm paying attention to all, to all of it, to all of it. That was so casual. Wow. Our state rep, guys. Okay, so let's just get it out there at the forefront, right? So this is a conversation where, again, we're gonna center black queerness, right? And especially as it pertains to what that looks like in Kansas City. And so you all do a number of different things throughout the city. Nas, Aisha, literally y'all have made nightlife accessible for black queerness. You have quite literally had the pop-ups. If y'all haven't seen the pop-up, you guys need to check it out because it is just so beautifully done. But you guys have made it a priority to center black queerness in Kansas City and been very unapologetic about it. So what is something that you have been able to see successfully happen and change here? That's a good question. Um, and it's something I was reflecting on a lot for the exhibits in the archive because I feel like the biggest thing is I wanted people to learn and I feel like yeah, to answer your question, I feel like a lot, I've seen a lot of people walk away from what I've done learning something new. Um, even black queer people who have been here do not do not know the histories. Um, and the project is about liberating histories from racism and homophobic erasure. And so um, if I can have like any part in doing that and people will just walk away learning even like a tidbit of knowledge, I think that that's super dope. Um, and I definitely think the past informs the future. Um, and a lot of the pieces um, that I researched, um, their conversations are like issues that we're tackling today. Maybe they're not exactly the same, but they're just like in different forms or in different shapes. And so um, the more people that learn about the trials and tribulations that black queer people had to go through in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, we don't have to keep having these same conversations in 2023 like let's move on let's go to step two um and so yeah it's just been really affirming to see people continue to learn and i just want to help um offer that to people well so over the last few months i have been out in the streets <laughs> and I've, I've talked to a, a large number of people i've introduced myself to so many people and people that have been in kansas city for a while um, i noticed that there is a mixture of i get fear i get um a lot of reluctance when i tell them hey i'm hosting events um and it's from um their past experiences and so 
I have seen some people that have expressed fear and have had bad, um, I guess, a bad ex had bad experiences in the past. I've seen them come out to the events and actually enjoy themselves. And so I'm hoping that that will be, I hope that I'm hoping to kind of change the the culture and the the narratives and I, I want to create a safe space safe spaces for people um i'm hoping that more people that have been here feel um what well, we're safe yeah um yeah so that's that's the changes that i've seen that was a good answer <laughs> no that was great that was great um and mine kind of falls into yours so i'm gonna assume i'm the oldest on this stage at the ripe old age of 37 and so I have seen the Kansas City gay scene, you know, over the past 20 years, really. Um, and uh, in my heyday, when I was parking lot pimping, because I was 18 and too young to get in the club, it was in like Sokey's parking lot, you know what I mean? And Tootsie's, um, you know, uh, my, my homie Kobe Harlan has been out here for decades, you know, trying to make an entertainment scene for us. Um, <clears throat> um, so, uh, but then um, it, it kind of disappeared for a while. There was, um, I guess, you know, violence kind of peaked and um, the community kind of disappeared. Um, it's rare that you see like black lesbians all in one place at the same time. Um, and as a lesbian, that's what I identify as. I can, I can say that, you know? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to see um, us get a gay commission. I'm happy to see pride colors on city hall. I'm happy to see, um, and even though it's horrifying, I'm happy to hear us talking about our trans sisters that we've lost, you know, because that's, that's just a narrative that has never been spoken before. Um, and there's a lot of great LGBTQIA plus history in Kansas City. Um, my girlfriend's back there. She's so hot. And she um, is so smart and makes me listen to podcasts all the time. And one of them uh, that KCUR does was talking about some gay history. And there was like a lesbian settlement here in Kansas City. And it was like surrounded by tulips. And that's how you knew when you came out of it or what. I had no idea. I've been here my whole life. So I'm happy to see these conversations happening, us us learning things. I just learned about the lavender scare, thanks to her. So we've been fighting this since like the 40s and 50s, actually. And 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 at the state, we have yet to pass um, non-discrimination to include sexual orientation um, and, and the back end of that. So so like we're still having these conversations, and it's because we never had them before. So I'm happy to see us working through this. Um, generational dysfunction. I don't call it trauma. I don't call it, well, it's trauma. It's definitely not curses. It's dysfunction and trauma and us bringing that to light and then having these conversations so we can move on past the conversation and put action finally forward. Y'all did that. Y'all did that. I didn't know that. <sighs> okay. So that, that brings me to a really good question because I think that it's important for people who maybe consider themselves as genuine allies or would like to consider themselves as genuine allies. And I think part of the issue is it is a fight that is not necessarily just for queer people, but it's also our jobs as just community to be able to support and rally around these issues. Right. And so tell me your experience when we think of, Kansas City, for what Kansas City is, what who resides in Kansas City. Um, but where is the thin line, where is the line for you between performative and actually being a genuine ally? Well, um, keeping your promises, if you tell us that you're gonna do something, could you do it? Um, actually respecting our boundaries if we tell you that this space is for us, could you stay out of it? Um, and then monetary support, put your money where your mouth is. Give us some money. We're more likely to be in poverty. We are struggling. Give us some money. I feel like for me, since coming to Kansas City, and I have kind of a skewed perspective because I've only been here two years, originally from Florida. I went to college in 
New Jersey, New York area. So I have like a couple different perspectives. Um, I think the Kansas City queer community it can, it can be strong and tight knit, but I feel like a lot of times um, for allies who are like looking to get involved in stuff, the way they think to get involved is like, come be a vendor at my thing or like, let me purchase something or it's like very capital centric. And it's like, I need you to go put your life on the line for me so I can have some rights. Like, I do not need you to buy a damn bracelet or a tote bag. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't not care about that. Like, I think that allies need to be doing more work that is in the realm of changing systemic issues that are affecting us. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like definitely the line for me is like, if you want to support me, but the only way you will support is in like having me come table sit at something or vent something or something that's not going to really push the needle forward for queer Kansas Cityans, black queer Kansas Cityans. Um, I was just thinking about this crazy, like earlier, like what is an ally, you know? Um, and I thought about a good friend of mine, her name is Crystal Quaid. Um, she's about to run for governor and uh, she just announced she's running for governor and she's our um, minority floor leader, right? So she, delegates how all the legislation goes on the Democrat side on the floor during debate. That's her job. Um, kind of a Chuck Schumer, but in the house, right? Um, Pelosi, but good version in the house. Um, <laughs> she's done that. That woman's done a lot. Those are, we're, we're not going on that tangent. Anyway, Crystal, um, Crystal, not only you know, stands up and and shows up when they're doing the um, the hearings about trans kids being illegal in whatever capacity. Not only does she show up and hug every baby in that room, um, but she's shown up to Black Lives Matter movements with the T-shirt on and done the body link, you know? Um, and there's several other instances that I can think of where she's actually stood 10 toes down. Um, and I think a lot of it is what you said. A lot of it tends to be um, think from a capitalistic standpoint, but you know that the the um, Euro Americans tend to think from that because that's what they've been taught. So that's kind of how they show love. Um, but we, as a you know uh, emotional and physical people, um, we don't accept it like that always. Um, so I think that that is what an ally does. An ally shows up in the dark moments, in the quiet moments. <laughs> I remember uh, one of the legislators um, got pulled over uh, for drinking and we called Crystal and we said, hey, this is going down. And it's like midnight. She's been asleep for an hour and she's been up since six in meetings all day on her feet. And she was like, where do I need to be? What do I need to do? What's the account number? What do I need to do? And we were like, we got it. We'll just keep you posted. And she like checked in like every 30 minutes after that. That's an ally. So in that respect, I think it is, it would behoove us to not also have a conversation about the intersections of queerness, right? In Kansas City. And so as someone who, my job is literally to listen to people. I um, find lots of pleasure in just having community be able to pull up and just talk to me about things. I don't get to go outside very often. So y'all keep me like my ear to the street. And so I definitely, as someone from Kansas City and just kind of seeing pride in Kansas City kind of develop and to what it is today, but like there are still so many conversations from different aspects of people um, all up and down the spectrum that are black and brown and indigenous, um, but queer that also do not feel represented when we think about pride in Kansas. And so white um, queer people within that community, but there's there also seems to be quite a difference in kind of like an absence of inclusion for people of color who also identify as queer here. And so what are some ways in which one, we can like address that and call it out? Because I think at this point, like it's safe to say anytime there is now a push for inclusion somewhere, there's someone that's going to get left out. And that's just how the hierarchy works. So one, what can we do to call that out? And two, 
what does that look like in Kansas City for us to like move past that? Okay, I'm gonna be controversial up here. <laughs> um, okay, so in my work, I've done like a lot of research on things that were happening to black Kansas Cityans, black queer Kansas Cityans in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, and one of the pieces, the second piece, it was this, about this group of gay men called Men of All Colors Together. And they were fighting racism amidst gay men in Kansas City. Um, but one of the things that happened is there used to be this gay bar here called the Dixie Bell Bar. And it's a bar, like ever since I've came to Kansas City, like I've heard a lot of white Kansas Cityans talk about the Dixie Bell Bar, loud about it, um, reflect on it. Um, just be real happy with that space. But in doing my research on this um, organization in the bar, one of the black members of the organization wrote this open letter to the Dixie Bell Bar because they had a Confederate flag hanging in their bar um, and also had various quotas on the amount of black people who could be in the bar at one time and also asked for multiple forms of, multiple forms of identification from black gay men trying to get into the bar. I guess black people in general versus white gay people who are in the bar. And so I bring that up because, um, as I said in my previous answer, I feel like we have to get past step one. And I feel like um, a lot of the queer nightlife here is not open to black queer people. And that's why I really appreciate what Aisha is doing because um, it's important for us to have spaces. Um, and just to, like, to give an example, like for this project I'm working on, I was trying to work with Fountain House and like they didn't fulfill like any of their promises that they had promised me for black and brown Kansas Cityans like trying to attend their bar. And so I think I used to touched on it a little too. It's just like a lot of white businesses here will give like you give black queer people here words of affirmation like we here for you because we're oppressed too. Shout whatever. <laughs> like like I said, like you they show up in that way, but it's like you have to do more to push the needle. And if you're not going to fulfill your promise, um, and if you're going to continue to repeat things that have been happening for years upon years, like we don't have solidarity. Like I don't want to be in community with you. You have to do more if you to, if you want black queer people to be in community with you. You have to go the extra mile because we're putting ourselves on the line like every day, and you breaking promises, you not being there for us. So, um, yeah. And that's where I'm leaning to. It's unfortunate. Um, you know, we want to have this. We want We don't want to exclude anybody. But after years of being excluded and then, you know, when we're when we're in, when we're sharing spaces with white queer people, it's like they steal our culture they don't understand us they don't see us it just it does not i don't want to say it doesn't work for everybody because i've seen some people in action but um it, it's i think it's better to have our own spaces we need we need our own spaces and that's um that's why i'm doing what i'm doing it inclusion is like this it, it seems like this abstract thing almost um and, you know, I've talked to, like I said, quite a few people. And I, I know there are a lot of people that agree, like a, a lot of the black queer community agrees, we need our own, our own spaces, so. So it's, it's racism in the gay clubs, right? Basically was the question. Check. Okay. Um, so I, I heard an interesting stat a couple of years ago that there were only like 14 lesbian clubs left in the country in the country. Um, how many? S oh, it's down to seven? Okay, it's down to seven. Star, Star Palmer, who is um, an aficionado in the community. <laughs> um, and another one who has been working on getting um, some, some diversity within um, the gay scene, right? Like, I don't go to Missy B's, right? Cause that ain't for me, right? I don't go to uh, Sidekicks, cause that ain't for me. So I don't go to Woody's unless it's a night that baby boy is there. So that ain't for me. Um, so where am I supposed to go? And um, I was not happy when I saw Fountain House pop up. I was like, another gay white club. Sweet God. 
So then some friends of mine started working. Uh, okay, let's try to make a lesbian night one night, maybe downstairs. Let's get some black chefs in there. Let's let's do something to, you know, make this space inclusive. And um, we haven't quite reached that spot, so I'm really interested. I unfortunately haven't, I've been in Jeff City and stuff, so I haven't heard about all the spots you got going on, but I'm super excited about the possibility of that. Cause I have been literally probably since 2000 trying to wrangle up the black influencers, the black get the black lesbian influencers um, and be like, Hey, we need to put our capital together. Make us a club, man. We don't have a lounge. We don't have a spot or we can go and just be us. Cause we're not wanted in those other spaces. Um, and when we do, they, um, you know, either try to make us assimilate or they, you know, culturally appropriate. So, uh, <laughs> those aren't, those aren't for us. So, um, I think that there's, um, a, a lot of work to be done still. And I think a lot of it is economically driven. As you said, it circles back around to capitalism as well. Where is, um, where is the capital in white males, whether they're gay or straight, that's where it is, um, because of disinvestment. Um, so I think that that has a lot to play with it, but you know, black people have the biggest spending power ever. And if we would get back to spending it with us, instead of making excuses about, oh, well, that club's run down, or oh, they got bad customer service, or your attitude is trash. Um, and we need to support our black businesses and our black spaces so that we can continue to drive. It's, it's, like, it's like being at an HBCU. You know, white people can go there, but that's not their space. And it's not gonna comfort them the way that they need to be comforted like we need to be. Um, so I'm always down for safe spaces for us. I've talked to other black lesbians that don't feel safe around the other letters of the alphabet. And it's unfortunate. Um, it's due to trauma and past encounters. And it just, it's its really sad. So it's, its yeah, we really need more spaces. That's a whole nother so, conversation. Yeah. I want to talk about how a drag queen stole my corsets. So, but yeah, there's, there's, there's <laughs> other, there's layers. Stole your there's layers within this. You um, said corsets? Yeah, sets. Oh. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> because I did want to go there. I did want to go there next, but Aisha, I think you kind of nailed it. Um, because I, again, anyone who talks to me for like five minutes, you will know how I feel about bell hooks and we can talk all day long about intersectional feminism. And I think that's always also gonna be something that I believe should be kind of at the forefront just because the way that society is structured, there's always gonna be a, someone at the top and someone at the bottom. And so the most marginalized people are always gonna be at the bottom. And so when we think about the different intersections of, okay, we're, we're black, we're brown, we're indigenous, maybe we're poor, maybe we're disabled, maybe we're queer. Like these are all the things that add to these intersections right and so when i think about intersectional feminism are you all familiar have we talked about bell hooks well i know we have yeah okay okay see it's coming soon we're gonna have the talk soon literally that's how i meet that's how i know my friends y'all so in that regard like we talk about intersectional feminism right and so that whole thought process is basically that if you again liberate the most marginalized people everyone will be liberated, right? So in that regard, when we think about blackness, queerness, it's Kansas City, so put the mid Midwest on it, right? But also to be a woman or a woman identifying person in these spaces is also something that I don't think there's enough conversation about. And although I do appreciate and I respect a lot of the conversations that we can now bring to the forefront that are long overdue around trans communities, or a trans people um, and, and all the things that are happening with them. But also when I think about black queerness and women as a woman and just being in a club space where you don't feel safe or in a city sometimes where you don't feel safe, um, how do you speak to like how you show up unapologetically and you consistently are programming and making spaces safe for black queer people, but also black queer women? So Queer Black KC is is new, but I do um I do wanna say that as an organization we do hold space for women and gender nonconforming people. So yeah, our events are for everybody in the in our alphabet, in our family. 
However, women and gender nonconforming people are that that's the prioritize thank you amber um so i've noticed that black women and feminine identified people i don't know what are the words these are so many words we're so vivid and um we're always the ones that are fighting for everybody we fight for everybody we run ourselves down we are tired um and so I think it's important to have, to hold space for us. Um, I think it starts with um, making it known, really, um, not tolerating uh, violence, not tolerating certain language um, in our spaces. Um, I'm still figuring it out how that, you know, what that looks like. But, um, and I feel like even just me having, me being the person that's, organizing it attracts other um people that identify similarly and so that builds a community and then we get to set those standards um and i feel like i'm rambling but so basically i'm not really uh i don't want to say i'm not sure but i think just being intentional holding space and setting those standards um early on which is i, I try to i try to do that so um I like to uh, joke in the capital that I'm a unicorn because I'm black, woman, gay, and a veteran. So I like check a whole lot of boxes. <laughs> and um, so speaking of intersectionality, so um, I, but if I think about, you know, the past several elections, it's been black women, black women who have, who have carried, um, you know, whatever politician it was. Um, and it, and, and as you said, it's, it's, it's always been black women who are at the cores, you know, war on drugs is black women holding it down, you know, and, and any time before that, even during slavery, it was the black women holding it down. Um, so men were just trying to survive. Um, and um, so I, I think that we carry a lot of strength with us, um, but we are not always taught to nurture each other um, and that's a, that's a woman thing, but that's particularly a black woman thing because it's like, all right, we're all taught to like fight for the boys or whatever, to be the best pick, you know, be the best prize. Um, so which means you have to like peck somebody else down. And when you're at the bottom, who else is there to pick on, you know? So then we just end up fighting ourselves. It's that, you know, crab in a barrel, but why are the crabs in a barrel, you know, kind of question. Um, so I think that, um, I think that it has been powerful for people to see a black lesbian who wears tailored men's suits and Stacey Adams with her hair curly talking about black love and queer love and human rights. Um, because I'm, I'm always in front at one of the, you know, rallies when, uh, when our trans kids are under attack or something like that. So, um, I'm, I'm, I, but, but, but one of the things that the, the younger generation is, is showing, and I can say younger generation because I'm old enough to have a kid who's like in that generation, um, this mental health talk that we're having um, and conversations that are coming from that is doing a lot of healing. Um, and it's bringing a lot of like people together who necessarily wouldn't be together. It's like black people doing tiny goat yoga and stuff. I hear you talking about yoga, you know? So like that is, <laughs> that, I think that is um, simultaneously working also to kind of like push this narrative forward where, you know, you got the Crown Act, which has brought, you know, black hair, you know, to the forefront, um, which I also helped sponsor and have had hearings on in the Capitol. So I think that there's <laughs> I'm just saying that, we, like you said, we are in a lot of spaces and we are always at the front. And now we're starting to learn to love each other. Um, so I just I see it moving forward and I see us in a good space. Hey, I'm gonna stop giving y'all the commentary. Um, aren't they great, y'all? That was so good. Okay, nice. You didn't get off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's important also balance. Um, so at the top, we started with pronouns, right? So you use they and them. 
Um, and so I think it's the Midwest. You've been, you know, you've been in Florida, you've been in New Jersey, some places that are a little bit more metro centric. They're a little more progressive, a little bit faster. Um, and I think we're always playing the catch up game. It's the Midwest. So, you know, it comes to us when it comes to us. And when it when it happens, hopefully everyone just gets on board. And so as a transplant here in Kansas City, but also someone who has continuously made efforts to bring activism into the work that you do um, and the way that you show up in the communities and all the different intersections in which you cross, what do you think has been the biggest adjustment for that? Before I answer that question, on the last question, I I want to emphasize that, yeah, Black women have always been at the lead of these movements, especially Black queer movements. Um, and we can fact check it, too, because um, in a lot of the historical research I've done, um, it was Black women or Black trans or gender nonconforming people who were leading the charge. If y'all didn't know, the founder of the Kansas City Pride Parade was Leah Hopkins. She was a black lesbian. She also helped found, this is lesser known, but she helped found the gay student union at UMKC, um, along with a couple others. And she was also involved in a lot of other movements. I don't want to get this wrong, but I also want to say too that one of the people who helped found Women Town, which was the lesbian collective here in Kansas City, was a black lesbian as well. Um, so, just want to put that out there. Do you have any more of your prints? Like prints? The girls? Yes, I do have prints. You can buy them at PH Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> they are beautifully done, y'all. So if y'all don't have them, literally, it's incredible. They're limited edition, so make sure you get them. And they are Kansas City local people that we should be honoring. So, light plug. Period, yeah. Help me buy a Happy Meal or something. But <laughs> going back to your question about the biggest adjustment... I think, yeah, to your point, it's just like Kansas City's be hot. It's hard for me to talk about this subject because I feel like coming from Florida, when I go to other states, a lot of people, you know, talk bad about Florida automatically. And yes, there's a lot of shit happening in Florida. <laughs> like, I go lie. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in Florida, but at the same time, there are also black and brown people who exist there who are doing the work who are trying to liberate themselves from fucking Nazi DeSantis. Um, and so I don't think we can just like write off Floridian people. We can't just be like, let's secede from Florida because yeah. <laughs> some of our people are there too because some of our people are there too. And so like, I never want to be the person who's like, oh, like, screw this city or screw this state because there are people here who are doing the work. I just think that, you know, there's different levels to it. And so Kansas City is just on a different level. And so I feel like the whole pronoun thing has just been kind of like a social experiment for me. Like I'd tell people my pronouns and they're like, period. And then it's like, he, 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 he. And I'm like, okay, cute. I know I do not want to fuck with you <laughs> after this conversation, but it's like, I don't, I really, don't see it as like a big deal anymore. I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm just like observing the landscape. And so I just feel like that's been the biggest adjustment for me, just like, you know, reconciling that like, even though Kansas City is like on a different level, you know, we got to work towards what we want. And at the same time, there's like other things like we're ahead in, like public transit is free here and it's not going to be free in New York or Cali. Um, so it's just we on a different level and that's the adjustment for me. Okay, softball question. Are we good on time? Okay, okay. Last question and then keep one up. Okay, okay. Last question, a softball question. What does liberation look like for you? Okay, follow up. Does liberation, like, personally, like, in the, on an individual level, or liberation for, like, community? Both. You know, I'm a politician. I'm down for this. Um, what does liberation look like to me? Liberation looks like... 
<laughs> liberation looks like um, a fully funded school district. Liberation looks like public transportation that goes more than north and south, also goes east and west. Liberation looks like I can afford a house and all the maintenance that comes with it. And I know how to maintenance that house. And I know how to pay my taxes so I don't lose it. Um, liberation looks like my job pays enough for me to live and thrive, not just survive. Um, so once we kind of start on those things, and I start with the school district because that's the crux of it. Um, cause if you don't have an educated populace, then we're stuck where we are. And that has been intentional disinvestment. Um, like some of these developments around here, three light, uh, they get these things, there's, there's three light, it's up. And they get these things called TIFs. Well, TIFs is tax increment financing. And that means they don't pay their property taxes for 30 to 50 years. But what is funded by those property taxes? School districts. So you can't tell me my kids is bad and then not fund the school district. You can't tell me my kids is bad and not have anything for them to do. It was hot summer nights back when I was a kid. Um, and we got to play and nobody got shot. Uh, liberation looks like these babies not being worried about putting a metal plate in their backpack. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. Mm. Well, shoot. Um, it's hard for me to picture liberation within the way, within the system, like the, the systems that we have in place now. It's, it's just really hard for me to, to see it. Um, for me, on a personal level, uh, my catchphrase is fuck that job. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, it, it's freedom to choose like what I actually want to do with my time, not trading my time for labor constantly, um, having to play this game that I did not ask to play. Um, that's liberation for me. I don't know who else agrees. I know some people will tell me I love my job. I love what I do. But basically, just my whole existence is money. It's just it's about money. So capitalism is is evil. <laughs> so, like, I think I'll rescind my follow -up, the follow-up question I asked you because I feel like liberation for one person has to be the liberation for all. But I okay. feel like I the defender. Period. <laughs> well, in that line, I consider myself an abolitionist, and so I feel like for me, liberation is just like everybody being able to fulfill their basic human rights. Like, I think the fact that we have to pay for food, like I have to pay to eat, I have to pay to have a roof over my head, I have to pay to get around to places is crazy. Like who decided this? <laughs> like, <laughs> like if I don't get money, that just means like I can't eat, I can't live. Like it's either I have money or I die. And so I, I it's hard as Aisha said, to picture that where we are. But I mean, I think that's what it looks like for me. Um, and obviously there's a lot of things that come with that as well. Um, I think a lot with the Kansas City Defender, a lot of the stories we're reporting on are just like black people being like senselessly murdered. Just recently, um, this black man was murdered at a gas station on July 4th. And like, he was murdered because a white supremacist like literally just ran up, went up to the cashiers who were at the gas station and they were like, do you want to see me kill uh, N word? And then murdered him, which is like insane. Um, and so along with like fulfilling our basic human rights, like part of that too is like seeing me like as a human being, like because I'm black, I deserve to die. Like that's crazy. So. I think that's what liberation looks like to me. And I guess we'll just see what the future holds, I guess. See, that was easy, right? Softball. I just want to personally say thank you for your space, for your time, and for your voice, for sharing that with us. It is 
literally there is no such thing as community and ecosystem without everyone contributing however they show up to contribute and I deeply respect all the work that's being done. And so you all are constantly creating safe spaces. And I think as we leave this space and continue on forward, but like, we'll keep hearing words like, you know, is it inclusive? Is it safe? Like, we'll continue to hear these things, but I applaud you all for literally putting that into action and making that a thing. So thank y'all. And if anybody has questions, It's recorded. Yeah. Hey, y'all. How you doing? As the mother of a non-binary child, I am curious because you spoke quite eloquently about how you've seen things grow and progress. When you answer that question about liberation, what do you feel we as community need to put into place to support generations of people so that my baby isn't sitting on this stage 15 years from now answering these same questions. Well, um, thank you for supporting your child. <clears throat> um, you know, I come from the generation of uh, couch surfing lesbians and um, you know, uh, my parents have, have, have come around, but it, it took a second for them to mourn the death of the thoughts that they had for me. Um, and, 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 and it's all worked out now. And actually, if we got into it, my story's pretty crazy. Um, but I think that we as black people particularly um, have to get out of some of our trauma from the colonizers and not be so scared. Um, you know, I know in the Caribbeans, you know, um, uh, buck breaking and, you know, just all of the negative connotations that black people specifically have with gay things or gay associated things. Um, so, you know, first we have to work through that fear. Um, you know, the, the black church has been really rough on us even though every choir director is a gay man. <laughs> Michael Charles, rest in peace, from St. James. You know, um, so I think that, um, but I think that that is happening and that it's happening with black people going to therapy. That's happening with black people talking about, your uncle molested me, so therefore I'm scared of whatever, whatever, you know? Um, so for you to accept your child and then embrace your child is gonna change generations anyway. I agree with that. Just like holding space and being accepting of, cause things are constantly changing. We're constantly changing. Like our, percep like our perception uh, changes, our understanding of gender and just humanity in general really, but gender and sexual orientation is constantly evolving. And so just like holding that space and also educating yourself I think that will make a world of difference, so. I think the last quick thing I'll add is, um, I think that school systems and education have like a very big part in that as well. And we're not gonna progress anywhere if like you can't even talk about being gay in school. And so um, Leah Hopkins, um, she used to have a son, may he rest in peace, but when legislation was happening during her time. She was at the school, like, why can't my son do this? Or why can't queer people at the school do this? Um, and I feel like that's not really being seen anymore. I used to work for an education nonprofit and parents don't really be vocal like they used to, like showing up to schools um, and fighting for their children. And so um, I think that's important too, as much as it like acceptance happening in the household, um, and in those early years, like, we also have to be organizing around schools and making sure that they're not trying to quite literally erase us from history. Can I swing that around to one of my things? So you said we, we have to be, like, diligent in the schools as well. Well, those, those schools are run by the state. And a lot of black people still say my vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't count because you didn't show up. And every time we show up in mass numbers, 
from um, from Reconstruction to Obama, anytime we show up in mass numbers, we win. Um, and, and when we don't, we see chaos like this. And I know a lot of people are tired. They're like, I just voted. Well, uh, I, I have this I have this new analogy I'm trying out. Uh, so, so tell me if this lands or not. All right. <laughs> have you ever had a garden? You had a garden before? So you know that you have to be in that garden 365 days. It's not just in the spring. It's not just in the summer. It's 365 days, making sure rabbits ain't burrowing and, and, and fungus isn't growing and all the little things, right? Well, voting is the same way. If you don't vote and you don't show up, then your garden goes to havoc. It goes to chaos and you have to pull weeds and do all this extra work, which makes it cumbersome. But if you get used to toiling in that garden every day, it can become therapeutic. So if you don't vote, our roads don't get repaired. If you don't vote, our schools get dismantled, defunded, and our kids are abused in them. If you don't show up and vote, um, your groceries keep getting higher. Inflation keeps getting out of control. All those things are based off of somebody that somebody voted on somewhere. So get out in your garden and let's make this thing work. Okay, you did that. That was a good one. Thank you all again. If there's no more questions. Oh. Uh, um, so Black Lesbian Lounge. Well, there's okay, so if you actually <laughs> there is a already a black les uh, not it's not a black lesbian event there is a lesbian event that happens at fountain house and they want it to be more women of color but like um but as far as like black lesbian events and stuff um that's coming but i don't ha i don't have anything right now and then there are other people in the community i'm not going to say any names but their name might be star um has also mentioned some black lesbian things um so <laughs> We have to work on it. Like we're here, we we gotta work on it together. Like I I can't do everything. <laughs> so. But that also means you guys we gotta show up when we start throwing events so we can know how oh, many they people show are up. out These there. These folks show up because they well, no, now. They show up. The, the people in the camera, use out oh, there yeah. in the world. <laughs> this camera. We we gotta we gotta show up and and show support because we're not going to know who can be a viable capital partner if you don't show up. So we need everybody out the house and back in these streets. So we can see our community safely. Ooh, safely. Safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on now. But one more time for the people in the back, because for real, it's a lot of stuff happening, y'all. And you will never know if you just stay in the house. And I'm people, I'm talking about me. <laughs> but again, thank you all to our panelists. Thank you to the Keystone for having us here. Thank you, Craig, Black Excellence KC, for another incredible conversation. Can you tell people where to find y'all? Real quick, how y'all want to be found? <laughs> well, you want me to say my Instagram? Like, where, whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, wherever people can access the work that you do and like support you. Yeah, so if you want to view um, the history of Black Creek Kansas Cityans from volume one, it's like from the 1900s to present day, you can go to PH Coffee, that's in the historic Northeast. It's intentionally there because people need to stop talking shit about the Northeast. Um, so you can view the exhibit there. Um, there are limited edition prints there, a lot of history there. The information is also accessible online at kansascitydefender.com slash BQKC. Um, and if you want to connect with me, my Instagram is 1-800-NAZI. Thank you. <laughs> He's on our, our Instagram. Just go on our follow. Oh. Or there. I'm so sorry. They are on our Instagram. So um, we're on all social media. Queer Black KC, if you just type that in um, Instagram, Queer Black. It's Queer Black, but the K and the C are flipped. So you can just type in Queer Black KC and you'll find us. So, um, uh, As I said, I'm an elder millennial, so I'm on the Facebooks. 
Representative Ashley Bland, man, love. It's the whole thing, but you should see my picture when it comes up. I was serious. I know you are. I'm, I'm on the Instagram. Uh, it's man love for Missouri. Um, or you could do one better and drive down to 301 Capitol Avenue, Jefferson City, Missouri, and put your face in the place. That building is open almost 365, and it's actually called the people's house. So I would love to see more of our people in it. You can come. We are in session January to May, uh, Monday through Thursday. So pop on down and say hi to me. I'd really appreciate it. I need some love down there. You are doing the thing, first of all. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, and NGCs. <laughs>